So did you receive the assignment? Yes, ma'am, we received. All right. Do you want me to explain it? Oh, it's clear. Better if you explain, ma'am. All right. Okay, let me share the assignment first. Okay. Uh, here, uh, pedagogical psychology assignment. Uh, you can see no? the screen I am sharing. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, date of presentation is 19th, that is coming Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, instructions for the presentation on motivation in learning. I told you that motivation is very important. 30% of your teaching is successful if motivation that. If you have strategies to motivate your students. So the topic of your presentation is motivation in learning. Refer to the material attached for your reference in Annexure 1 and 2. And select any era, area of your choice for the presentation. Uh, because it's only 4 to 5 minutes. So you can't present everything in that uh, document uh, about motivation in learning. So you have to read the whole thing and you have to select a component which can be managed in four to five minutes and present. Okay. So you have uh, definitions of motivation. You have uh, types of motivation as intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So you have uh, classroom examples for intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Then motivational theories are there. I have given you two theories. First one is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And how it can be applied in classroom by the teacher. And the second one is Keller's model of motivation. They are Keller's ARCS model. A for attention, R for love relevance, uh, C for confidence, and S for satisfaction. So you have to read it. Right, and you have to select an area. Give me a second, Puta. Hello. Hello, yes. I'm audible now, no? Yeah. Hello, please respond. Can I can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. Right. So you can select a component. You don't have to take the whole uh, theory or whole document. I think better if you can actually select either um Keller's model or um uh, hierarchy of needs by Maslow and when you actually present it uh, now you have four to five minutes so two, you actually uh, have to divide your presentation into two you have to explain the theory and you have to explain the classroom or teaching learning application of it otherwise it's not a complete um, presentation uh, that is why I have said your presentation should cover both theory and practical aspects relating concept of motivation to learning and teaching. Okay. So duration of your presentation is four to five minutes. Don't exceed time. So in your main uh, criteria also, you can see 
uh, time management is actually very important. Uh, here you can see time management, delivery, time management. If you exceed time, actually it means normally a presentation is very well prepared. So preparation is a must. So once you prepare, they say you have to actually present it in front of the mirror and you have to actually present it to your friends or your family and your toro because you're not going to read from the paper. Right In your slides, you can have only the keywords, images, or grids, or something like that only. You can't write whole thing, everything on a slide, and then read it from the slide is not uh, actually proper. So look at uh, the criteria, and accordingly you prepare. And uh, you need to have the camera on during your presentation. So you have to share the PowerPoint slides and you have to have your camera on as well. Uh, so this is a very good experience for you. Um, the formative assessments or continuous assessments, the purpose is that uh, you have to work on your own, engage in self-study and then be prepared. And that is actually make you to develop, improve a whole lot. So I want you to do that and come. Uh, so you will be evaluated on what you present. Any questions? Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, can we take a definition of motivation and types of motivation as the topic for our presentation? Yeah, that of course is okay, but you will be in trouble because there's nothing much you can actually um, discussing it you have to present it for four to five minutes okay ma'am you are at a disadvantage there yeah? if you take that part only because then you have to actually take a lot of time to define motivation and then the two types of motivation with classroom examples that is the area covered no so that is actually very little that you have to actually do in a presentation so you are at a disadvantage. But if you want to do it for four to five minutes, if you think that you can, okay. Right? Okay, madam. Madam, uh, when we take types of motivation, can't we uh, describe only one type? No, ma'am? Yeah, then actually it's incomplete, no? Okay, ma'am. Yeah, that is not a wise thing to do at a presentation or in an assignment. So you can easily, you have four to five minutes for the presentation. That means you can actually adequately cover areas because um, uh, you have to be very well prepared. You're thorough with what you're going to present. So you have to know to do maximum within the time frame is kind of uh, doing a presentation, right? So I don't think that you have to only discuss one type because you have enough time talk about both okay right? i think it's a good experience for you so get ready and don't get inhibited if you do your part you are entitled for marks but uh, getting ready is very important right being prepared for that and spend time and do it on kind of with uh, much dedication is important then only that you will improve right no more questions Uh, you received the annexures also, no? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh, right. Okay, then. Uh, can I actually start my lesson then? Sure. Yeah. Okay, now we finish um, introduction to psychology. We finish lifespan development in that we finish Piaget's theory. And then we actually started the cognition and the cognitive process. And then today I'm going to cover learning. Pedagogical psychology means pedagogy means learn teaching. So other side of the coin is learning. So teachers should know if you are teaching how the students learn. So that is going to be today's discussion, okay?
Now, did I give you any other work that you have to do today? Did I ask you to come prepared to do so anything? No, ma'am. No. Silence. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma Hello. Could we get it? And it's sorry to say this, but I couldn't attend for only past two lectures. So totally, I don't have any idea of this. Uh, can I take at least past lessons documents? Who is this? Ma'am, uh, Shara Shama. Ma'am, yes. Shara, it's... can you talk to me? Yes. Can you hear me, ma'am? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, I couldn't attend to past two past lecture so can i get so some this, today is your first day no i could attend only past two lectures only uh, so you have to speak to the institute for that i'm sending all the materials to them uh, but we didn't get that's why so you have to talk you have to talk to them oh, okay ma'am then i'll talk right to them. yes please make sure that you collect everything and go through them otherwise you will be a loser right Okay, ma'am. Yes, madam. Yeah. Uh, I am Sanjula. Yeah. I'm also having the same problem. So you that have the means... same solution. Okay. <laughs> right? I requested I think... them uh -huh. uh, by giving a call also, but even this presentation details, we not know. Uh -huh. That, of course, I will also communicate to them by actually calling them that material and everything that you have to actually pass it on to the students on time. Otherwise, they can't be prepared and all that. Till I will pass the message to them and you also keep on asking because okay. actually it's the institute. I, I'm actually sending them to them. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Right. Okay. And um, let me open my slides. Um, you have to give me a second. Give me a second, Pita. Uh, I can't locate my PowerPoint. Give me a second. All right, it's there. No worries. I see. What happened? You need to give me some time. I'm traveling. You have to give me a second, okay? Sorry for that. It's okay, ma'am. Yeah. It's okay, ma'am. Yeah, I can't may look it. Uh, I saved it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
that the cell right. something to it. Right, I'm opening. I found the right. Now I'm sharing psychology of learning. Okay, can you see psychology of learning? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay, so today we are looking at learning as the topic, right? According to psychology, how learning happens. So can I can I ask you a simple question? As you understand, how does learning occur or happen? How does it happen? Learning, as you understand. You don't have to wor worry whether it's right or wrong. As you understand, maybe that you have some experience in teaching or maybe that you have been a learner all throughout your life. So you have some understanding how learning happens. So can you talk? Acquiring knowledge. Uh -uh. Learning is acquiring knowledge. As we said in cognition, uh, memory and all that, you say acquiring knowledge. My question is not what learning is. I ask you how learning happens. You misunderstood my question, no? By doing things like practically. All oh, right. Experience. Uh, you say uh, experience. Uh, experience very good so what else that you can actually uh, tell about it hmm? imitating ah very good imitating also a way of actually learning right learning can happen through imitation that, very good uh, reading uh, new words Ah, oh, you say that reading through reading a uh, uh, new words learning new can happen. Okay. Experience with the motivation. Ah, because of the motivation also learning can happen. Okay. Experience. Experience definitely yes. Then. Okay. So very good. So with that understanding. <laughs> You say, no, you're not clear, Sulochana. I can't follow you, Sulochana. Right. Now, anyway, we will actually look at uh, what learning through psychological lens. Right? We are first looking at learning through psychological lens. Because uh, philosophers, Plato, then uh, so many, John Davy, right? Uh, Socrates, they all talk about what learning is. But we are going to look at learning through psychological lens. And according to psych educational psychologists, learning is something very difficult to define. According to educational psychologists, learning is something that is very difficult to define. So because of that, we will look at one definition given by Woolfolk. Right? According to Woolfolk, right? Oh, this is wrong, but I'm sharing once again. I don't know why. Uh, Give me a second. Wrong one. I was sharing. Uh, what happened? You need to give me time. So I will be talking to you while searching for the slides. According to Woolfolk, Woolfolk is an educational psychologist. According to Woolfolk, you can understand what learning is better 
I repeat, you can understand what learning is better if you look at what learning is not about. What learning is not about. Can I repeat according to Woolfolk's definition? Right? You can actually understand what learning is all about through psychological lens. If you consider or focus on what learning is not about. Is it clear to you what I said? Is it clear to you what I said? Silent killers, Appa. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I call you silent killers. Yeah, madam. Ah, uh, yes. So, tell me according, again. tell again, okay. Uh, according now, yeah, yeah, according to uh, educational psychologists, right? Uh, if you actually look at learning um, through psychological lens, right? Through psychological lens, they say learning is something very difficult to define. Very difficult to define. And they say, look at, you can understand what learning is. That is wolf folk, right? Wolf folk, you know, as something, as learning is something very difficult to define. Look at, look at, yeah, I'm copying. Look at. What learning is not about. Yeah, look at what learning is not about. Very good. Look at what learning is not about. Then you will actually understand what learning is all about. Uh, that is what they say, right? So, so we are going to look at Woolfolk's definition. Here it is. Okay, according to Woolfolk. According to Wolf 2004. You can see the slides now, right? Yes, ma'am. We can see. Yes, ma'am. All right. According to Wolf Folk, uh, yeah, I'm making it bigger. Learning occurs when experience causes relatively permanent change in an individual's knowledge or behavior. According to Wolf Folk, Learning occurs. You can say it has been learned. When experience causes relatively permanent change in an individual's knowledge or behavior. Now, for example, you want to teach some lesson. Maybe regular, irregular verbs to your students. So as a result of your teaching and as a result of their learning, now they can actually you know irregular verbs in English language. So there's a kind of a change in their knowledge and behavior or behavior. So that is actually learning. But he talks, he further talks about learning and say the key concepts, what it is not all about. Okay, what it is not all about. So let's say what it is not all about. Number one, here. Learning is not always deliberate. What is the first one? Can you say? Learning, learning is not, not always deliberate yeah. or intentional. Learning is not always deliberate or intentional. Unintentional, right, ma'am? Yeah, deliberate or intentional. Learning is not yeah. always deliberate. Deliberate, get a purposeful. Deliberate. Intentional. With intention only, it's done, purposeful. Emana, what does it mean? Not always deliberate or intentional. For better or worse. Uh, then, you know, you know, learning can happen unintentionally as well. What is it? Emana, indirectly, he says, learning can happen unintentionally as well. So learning is, number one is learning is not always deliberate or intentional. Indirectly, he is suggesting unintentionally also learning can happen. Second one, 
learning is not always about correct things you learn always not you always you do not learn correct things always you do not learn correct things what is indirectly suggested you might learn wrong things as well number 3 learning does not always happen in the classroom that means outside classroom also learning can happen so we discuss three fourth one fourth one now one is learning is not always deliberate so unintentional things can also learn learning is not always uh, you learn you learn not only right things that means you can learn wrong things also third one learning happens not only in the classroom that means outside class also there are ample learning opportunities fourth one is you learn not only knowledge you learn not only knowledge now indirectly it is suggested you learn skills and attitudes as well that is full four right that is full four so i repeat according to educational psychology learning is a concept that is very difficult to define okay learning is a concept that is very difficult to define i don't understand sanjula what is we are from eurasian eurasian campus madam uh, they are uh, they are from different university uh, because of that they do not receive the materials because there are two groups uh, oh, that may oh, be the reason uh, oh. if need uh, i don't know i can forward to everyone that, that is also better no uh, because yeah, they yeah. need it right yeah. now uh, if you are in a group or something if you have your contacts you can share no what you receive yeah yeah ma'am Right. If, if, uh, thank you, Stanna. I'm okay. sorry, uh, I have the same problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and my friend uh, shared me uh, all the materials to me. Uh, actually, uh, I informed the camp, uh, Eurasian campus, but uh, still I didn't get anything. Uh, and uh, they told me to uh, join this too. Uh huh. So anyway, now you are receiving, no? Uh, yes, ma'am. yeah you better speak to the authority i really do not know and mm -hmm. uh, try to actually uh, systematize it uh, i will also actually put them a message okay okay thank in you in the meantime much. keep in touch with each other and uh, share your material okay ma'am right okay then now i was giving you the kind of summary of wool folks definition he says better look at what learning is not all about then you can better understand what learning is about then he talk about four concepts according to wolf folk learning is a relatively permanent change in your knowledge or behavior right uh, learning makes you to change uh, it's a relatively permanent change and it can be seen in your behavior or knowledge so there are key knots that there are four knots that they talk about first not is learning is not always deliberate or intentional that means indirectly he suggests that learning can be unintentional also second one uh, learning is not always you learn not always right things so you may learn wrong things as well <laughs> the third one learning happens not only in the classroom outside class also learning can happen मुकाली वाहन वाहन ही कह रहा हूँ कुछ नहीं हमारे साथ वाला जिला दिल्ली रोड मारी 
Excuse me, madam. We can hear another voice. Our husband is calling. Madam, hello. Hello, madam. Hello, madam. Excuse me, madam. We can hear another voice. Hello, madam. Madam, excuse me, madam. Madam, someone is talking in Tamil. So we can. Microphone has been. We can mute. Yeah. I think it's Murshid. Murshid. Please mute your mic. Murshid, can you mute your mic? Murshid. Murshid. आधा संधि जीरा मैंने आरे पेमेंट अंगा टाउन लगा रहा हूँ। मैंने इट्स बेटर टू कीप अ मैसेज जो संधि। पुट अ मैसेज नो कैन यू पुट अ मैसेज? मतलब नो मंदिर आता है। क्या बात है तुका? मैं ना बारे नले नहीं देख रहा मेरे आस पास ही। हैं? बारे नले देख रहा है आंटी का। पत्ते किला में तो। ये केक ले आ रही ह� Hi, Murshid, I think you have to mute your mic. Murshid, mute your mic. Okay, right. Now it's better. No, the mic is not muted. Uh, so you see the slides? No. No, no. Disabled participants no. team. Show. And can you repeat the things again? Okay, give me a second. I was also disturbed. Okay. Uh, so I can't actually dis post disabled participant screen sharing. So now I'm not allowed to share my screen. That would be a problem, no? Post disabled participant screen sharing. So what can I do? Can I give them a call and see? Yes, madam. I think, uh, madam, you do not have sometimes uh, uh, to share. You need the permission sometime. I think you know I no I was sharing no it happened I um, mean um, accidentally or something I have been sharing no anyway now it is disabled uh, you the host now, because so I need to share has my give the host uh, to madam find it difficult no no madam yeah automatically the host has going to has gone to Sanjula Sanjula can you host madam. Okay. So can you explain uh, what should I do? In the participant list, there is there is a uh, there is more option button. I think uh, hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 Participant one is not here, no. More is there. Then participants, yes. In the participant, you can, I think you can see uh, there are uh, three dots. Yeah, three dots, yeah. Uh, then you can uh, give the host to anyone you want from that. I'll go to the dolphin and go around. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's, yeah, it's fixed now. It's okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's fixed. Okay. Right then. Manual gearbox. Excuse right. me, madam. Yeah. yeah. We can hear that Tamil person is talking. Yeah, oh, that of course I hear. Then what can I do about it? 
Madam Host I can uh, use his mic. If you can, Madam, let them to go, Madam, because it's disturbed. Yeah, I Madam, know it's disturbing. Yeah, you can Madam mute host, the mic, Madam. Host, Madam Host can uh, mute uh, his mic. So I'm not the host. No, no, no you Madam, you are the host. Now you are, no, you are the host. Yeah, I'm the host. Okay. Yeah. Ah, yes, I'm the host. So it was. Uh, uh, who was talking then? Now he has mute, ma'am. Mute. He has. He mute. has muted the mic. Yes. Yeah, muted. Yeah. No, ma'am. Still, Mubarika, Fausar, Mubarika, Fausar. Uh, okay, I will mute him or her. Now I have muted her. No. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, I have muted. Okay. Uh, then uh, now you know. So we were talking about wolf folk. According to wolf folk. Learning is a relatively permanent change in your behavior or knowledge, right? According to Wolfo, there are four knots that you can think of to understand what learning is better, right? The four knots are the first knot. Learning is not always intentional or deliberate. That means learning can happen unintentionally also. Second one, you learn not only the right things, you may learn wrong things as well. Third one, learning happens not only in classroom. That means outside classroom, there are ample learning opportunities. You have to make use of it, okay? Fourth one, uh, you learn not only knowledge, you learn skills and attitudes, in other words. So those are the four knots that you can elaborate on that and see and uh, learn or understand what learning is in a better way. That is Wolfo. So with that, we will actually have a look at learning theories that we are going to discuss. We are discussing some learning theories. So each and every theory discusses according to their belief how learning happens. So I have classical conditioning, operant conditioning, socio-cultural theory of learning by Vygotsky, Information Processing Theory of Learning by Gagni, Social Learning Theory by Bandura, and if time permits, we will discuss Laws of Learning by Thorndike as well, okay, if time permits. So we will take uh, theory by theory, and then you will, according to them, how learning happens. That is what we are going to look at. Why are we looking at one theory and then after that another theory and all that? Why? Because we have to go eclectic. E-C, L-E-C, T-I-C. We have to go eclectic as a teacher. That means different theorists, they talk about different ways of learning. But as a teacher, you're not going to be a slave to any of those theories. In your classroom, you will see what is applicable, what is appropriate. And accordingly, that you will draw um, elements from one theory and another element from another theory, uh, again another theory, element from an some other theory, and then you combine them and you will make your lesson a learnable one. So that is the modern teacher. You are eclectic. You know the term, no? Eclectic? Eclectic teacher. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Eclectic teacher means you use different, different notions from different, different theories appropriately. You are not going to make it a soup, but you are going to use them with understanding and appropriately. So your teaching is very effective. You are an eclectic teacher. For you to do that, you for you to combine elements drawn from different, different theories, you have to know what they are. There are pros and cons, where you can apply them, when you can apply them, and then only that you will be able to select and combine and blend. Is it clear to you, Puta? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma right. So yeah. we are going to, sorry. Can you explain it again? Again. What's your name, dear? Mubarika. Ah, Mubarika. You were listening to me? Yes, sir. Right, okay. Now, Mubarika, I was talking about theories of learning. 
so we are going to look at different 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 theories which discuss which discuss how learning happens okay how learning happens so in my discussion i'm going no, to i want to i want eclectic teacher what is eclectic uh, eclectic teacher eclectic teacher eclectic teacher means the teacher facilitates learning in the classroom through a combination of different elements from different different theories you are not 100% classical conditioning in the classroom you are not using 100% operant conditioning in the classroom you are not using 100% socio cultural learning theory instead you have that capacity and ability you draw some elements discuss in classical conditioning you draw some elements discuss in social learning theory of bandura and you combine them and conduct your teaching to facilitate learn you will be able to do that if you know what these theories discuss and what their elements are then you know i in my class today i can combine these these elements and do my teaching to facilitate learning so that kind of a teacher is called a eclectic teacher that is the 21st century teacher is it clear to you now mubarika yes ma'am thank you thank okay. you so much so we are going to discuss different theories and you are not going to use them in isolation on its own you will be at the end of the day you will be able to actually be eclectic others are you okay with what i said yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am okay. thank you for responding so we'll first look at classical conditioning by ivan pavlov which is a learning theory okay classical conditioning by ivan pavlov you can see the picture of ivan pavlov the theory is classical conditioning can you remember the very first day i talked to you about the four major schools of thought can you remember yes, yes ma'am so what are the four major behaviorism psychoanalysis humanism cognitivism oh, okay. right so this theory this classical conditioning by ivan pavlov it belongs to behaviorism behavioristic school of thought so according to now learning is a behavior right learning is a behavior so according to class behavioristic school of thought right what determines our what determines our behavior it is our i want the very word sorry what is it chanda it is our education so personality no no behaviorism i'm talking about that four major schools of thought now chanda behaviorism psychoanalysis cognitivism and humanism according to behaviorism behavioristic school of thought now uh, uh, ivan pavlov is a behaviorist he belongs to the behaviorism school of thought so according to now psychology is uh, studying the mind through the observable behavior so here the behavior is learning so according to behavioral school of thought um, our behaviors are a result of what what is their set of beliefs we behave like this because of our the very word the very word environment of parents environment what is it environment so environment is everything not within us in psychology what is our environment our parents our neighborhood our country our culture our society our language everything our friends uh, our siblings they are all our environment so according to classical conditioning uh 
uh, which is a behavioral theory of psych, uh, learning, they think that learning is a result of what? Our environment. Learning is a result of our environment. So in the school, in learning context, what is the child's environment? What is the child's environment in school? Peers, Teacher, teachers, peers, friends, yeah. school, class, culture, yeah. right? The textbooks, QUs, all these are the child's learning environment. So this is classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov is a behaviorist psychologist. So environment has a role to play in our behavioral changes, in our learning. Right? That is what it is all about. Now let's see what he talks about learn. Are you ready? Yes, madam. Right. If you want to understand Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning, right? I want to tell you one thing. You can take, make a note of that. According to behaviorist, according to behaviorist, Learning is a habit formation. What is it? Learning is a habit, habit formation. formation. According to behaviorists. According to behaviorist psychologists. You know, behaviorists. Learning is a habit formation. Learning is habit formation. Right? Learning is habit formation. So Ivan Pavlov also thinks that learning is habit formation. How can you get them to form habits? That is what Ivan Pavlov discusses in his theory of classical conditioning. So far, is it good? Understood? Yes, ma'am. Understood. Yeah. So if learning is habit formation, how can it happen according to Ivan Pavlov's classical condition? For that, you have to listen to my explanation on his study done on dogs. He did a study with dogs. And first you have to listen to that. What kind of a study that he has done with dogs? And then you have to understand how learning happens according to Ivan Pavlov, right? Now I'm going to talk to you about the study done by Ivan Pavlov with dogs to put forward this theory of classical condition. Right? Pavlov's dogs experiment. Now you know psychology branched out from philosophy and physiology. So Pavlov is a physiologist, not a psychologist. Okay? And he became a psychologist because Psychology branched out from physiology and philosophy, you know? Right. So, um, Pavlov was doing an experiment with some dogs. It's related to physiology, right? He was experimenting on the amount of salivation of dogs. Amount of salivation on dogs. It is actually accidental. It's not, it is uh, not actually um, intended but unintended, unintentional. But it led to the formulation of this theory. Okay? And he was doing an experiment with dogs uh, to uh, kind of see uh, the amount of salivation. And while, when he was doing that experiment, the dogs were caged. They were kept in a kennel. Right? And to give food. And to actually for other purposes, Pavlov had to take the dogs to the kennel door. So Pavlov had used a bell for that purpose. When he wanted to get the dogs to the kennel door, he used to ring a bell. Right? He sounded a bell. So far clear? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah, to give food also, you have to get the dogs to the kennel. So he sounded the bell, right? 
sound now you have to look at this now when you actually give food to the dog he was doing an experiment on uh, amount of salivation normally when you give food to a dog do they salivate naturally kela halana mada kamak dunna ma naturally yes ma yes. yes it is natural right you actually give them food they salivate it's a natural thing now what is your favorite food right channa what is your favorite food manioc leaves and rice why goodness <laughs> is it available in japan or russia russia no ma'am no only in sri lanka <laughs> that is it manioc leaves it's only melon that you can make no yeah ma'am it's very tasty i also know because we have manioc at home api ara kalawa melon we put one or two into that it gives a nice taste i know uh, yeah. so then uh, you miss them no right uh, yes, then you know then you know um, you get actually salivation no if you offered that food platter of course ma'am salivation happens so naturally when the dogs are given food salivation is high but if you sound a bell do the dog salivate no 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 that is not a natural thing it's a neutral thing for the sound of the bell dogs don't salivate so sound of the bell is neutral with regard to salivation but what happen now uh, to get the dogs to the kennel door for the, any purpose uh pavlov had to actually ring the bell so with that ringing of the bell if the food is given right salivation happens but if the food is not given initially no salivation because it's a neutral stimulus dogs don't salivate but after 2 3 months because to give food always a bell was sounded he used to salivation that is it and even food is not given yes, when the bell was sounded dog started salivating yes. dog started salivating why as a habit are... no no they no, i will tell you that is how new learning happens according to ivan pavlov now for us to discuss that you have to look at these words what is the first one unconditioned stimulus what is it Yeah. unconditional stimulus. Stimulus. stimulus what is unconditioned means not learned i mean you know unconditioned means what not Natural. learned natural natural condition karnawa kiyane learn uganda na kiyane unconditioned means not learned it's natural stimulus what is the natural stimulus in that dog's experiment food platter what is it avaru haniranga vaara anseram what is it food platter food platter yeah food platter right so in that uh, food platter is the uh, natural stimulus or unconditioned stimulus you actually the acronym acronym uses us and then what is the unconditioned response that is it is not learn it's natural what is the response of the dog salivation what is it salivation so it is you are in that study so neutral stimulus in the study no salivation neutral what is the neutral stimulus in the study ringing of the bell sound of the bell. bell sound of the bell so then there is a condition stimulus and condition response condition meet cs and cr learned what is the learned stimulus and learned response when the bell ring he a uh, sound of the bell is the condition stimulus learned stimulus condition respond is the salivation to the sound of the bell it's a new learning of by the dogs yes. how did it happen that is where the secret lies 
how did it happen now you know dogs unlearn natural unconditioned stimulus is food platter natural response or unconditioned response is salivating to the food platter that is natural but there is a neutral stimulus dogs don't salivate to the sound of the bell but later on after some time there is a new learning dogs started to salivate to the sound of the bell so the sound of the bell became the conditioned stimulus learned one and conditioned response is the salivation to the sound of the bell how did it happen it happened like this there was a bonding i repeat there was a bonding there was an association here there was a bonding or there was an association of unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus for some time unconditioned stimulus is the food platter neutral stimulus is the sound of the bell and they were paired they were bonded they were associated for some time then what was the results acquisition or learn what is the results acquisition of learn what is the learning now the sound of the bell become the conditioned stimulus salivating to the sound of the bell become the conditioned response now the dogs have learned something new the law the dogs have acquired something new what have they acquired they have learned to salivate to the sound of the bell but before the bonding before the association before the pairing up the dogs did not salivate to the sound of the ball bond bell it was a neutral stimulus so how did it happen the pairing up of association of bonding of the unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus for some time acquisition happens there is a new learning which is termed as condition stimulus and condition response are you okay with that explanation yes ma'am yes, yes ma'am yeah. so according to classical conditioning by ivan pavlov learning is habit formation and how does it happen you have to bond you have to associate unconditioned stimulus with the neutral stimulus for some time then there will be acquisition or new learning which is termed as condition stimulus and condition response so how can you actually apply this into classroom learning and teaching how can you apply this to classroom learning and teaching i will give you an example can i yes ma'am yeah now you have a student who is not interested in your subject suppose you teach english she doesn't like english at all so now you can see but you can now so english is a neutral stimulus english is a neutral stimulus because student doesn't show any interest then you can as the teacher you can look for something what you can look for you can think of an unconditioned stimulus and response in the with regard to that student are uh, you see the student likes working with his best friend the student like working with his best friend so as a teacher you are very smart you look for unconditioned sti stimulus us an unconditioned response you are uh, if you unconditioned stimulus is the best friend unconditioned response is the child's liking to work with the student friend so now you want to pair up the unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus what is the unconditioned stimulus in this example the best friend what is the neutral stimulus english now you you pair it up for some time you associate the two for some time you bond it for some time now you get the child to uh, sit in your english lesson uh, during your english lessons with the best friend okay now you have paired up english and the best friend after some time 
you can see the child likes to learn english even if the friend is not there because when she he started working with the friend as he likes the likes the friend he started liking english also now after 3 4 months you can see in the absence of the friend also the student shows interest in english so english become the condition stimulus and condition response is it clear yes ma'am yeah now i want to tell you this happened about 20 years ago in the university of uh, colombo education faculty one professor ola dabe pala actually he is a retired professor now and but he wrote a book on action research he has done that was based on classical conditioning and operant conditioning both now i will talk about the classical conditioning part you know in sri lanka students they don't like learning english in rural areas so english remains the neutral stimulus then he went and saw the students like games right they like to play games so it was the unconditioned response and the stimulus us and ur when you get them to do games they like it so roland abepal sir paired it up the unconditioned stimulus games with the neutral stimulus english so he actually conducted a kind of a project executed a project where english was taught using games it was a 3 six month action research at the end of six months there was a condition stimulus and condition response even in the normal classroom without games students started to like learning english this is bonding association because the unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus they were bonded or associated for some time for the actually creation of condition stimulus new learning of which is termed as condition stimulus and condition response are you okay with this explanation yes ma'am so yeah. can you give me can you think of another classroom example can you think of another classroom example um yes ma'am uh some doing uh, yeah teacher yes. can uh, uh keep some sweets because some children like uh before the lesson or after doing something teacher can yeah that is what the, what is the bonding there i'm asking you this is a bit of actually operant conditioning you are talking about what is uh -huh. now you have to think in terms of unconditioned mm -hmm. stimulus neutral stimulus think in terms of that madam do the game yeah. uh, to uh, as an evaluation uh, oh. af, i mean after the lesson doing a video game i, I mean related to the lesson doing a video game likewise i'm asking now what you tell me what is the unconditioned stimulus what is the neutral stimulus what is the new learning or the condition stimulus be intelligent yeah in the primary yeah. classes teachers mm -hmm. give uh, stars for children that is so, also operant conditioning putta madam in uh -huh. some lesson uh, we for the subtraction lesson oh so it mean maths lesson yeah uh, if we can give to do that activity if we can give beautiful things uh, for that activity so they love to do that because of those objects yeah that example is quite applicable slochana i will explain it like when you are talking about classical conditioning you have to talk in terms of unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response neutral stimulus and then the condition stimulus and the condition response that is a must so i take your example a uh, subtraction so students don't show any interest in learning subtraction or mathematics yeah 
and you know as the teacher students like to work or uh, work with uh, real yeah beautiful yeah. things that so true. you now con- unconditioned stimulus is real yeah unconditioned response is students liking for real yeah neutral stimulus is learning mathematics subtraction so you are going to bond or associate unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus so neutral stimulus learning mathematics subtraction is combined with associated with real yeah beautiful real yeah then after some time what happens even without real yeah your Very students good. will like to learn mathematics that is condition stimulus and condition response am i right yes ma'am i will give you another example right um uh your students um they like naturally what they like that you first look at neutral stimulus something that they don't respond and you want them to respond so you can think um, uh doing homework right doing homework they don't like right so then it's a neutral stimulus now you want to get them to like to do homework uh, you want to convert this neutral stimulus into a condition stimulus and response so you think of a way uh, if you look at ivan pavlov's classical conditioning you can pair up this neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus so you look for an unconditioned stimulus ah uh, they like watching video they like watching video so you make it a habit that always you give them homework based on a video that they have to watch so then homework and video watching is combined associated bonded for some time so you continue to do it for two months then after two months you don't give them any video still give them over they have started doing homework even if there are no videos to watch so there is a condition stimulus and condition response that is learned thing which is termed that acquisition they now do homework it's the neutral stimulus that is transformed into the condition stimulus and response clear or not clear clear ma'am right anyway this is according to behaviorists learning is habit formation learning is habit formation so it is lower order learning they don't talk about higher order learning where they have to think problem solve uh and uh, uh synthesize and all that because for behavioral school of thought behaviorism learning is a matter of habit formation but in our primary classroom we actually learning is limited to lower order learn am i right yes ma'am yeah so for lower order learning to happen you can use opera sorry classical conditioning you can actually combine neutral stimulus with unconditioned stimulus and form or create or perform new learning are you okay yes ma'am always think of a neutral stimulus that you want to transform into a condition stimulus then if you want to do that which is termed as acquisition you have to think of a unconditioned stimulus and response and you have to associate the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus for some time and then you can create a conditioned stimulus and a response a new learning happens and that is acquisition are you okay yes yes everyone yes so according to behaviorists learning is habit formation so it's limited to lower order learning higher order learning like think of uh, 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 problem solving creativity is not applicable okay now key principles in uh, classical conditioning i remove uh, spontaneous recovery there 
but I get you to look at these acquisition and extinction because it's the stepping stone of operant conditioning. Okay, it's the stepping stone of operant conditioning. So acquisition, can you read what is given under acquisition? It's already discussed. Can one of you read it to the rest of the class? Acquisition is the initial stage of learning when a response is first established and gradually strengthened. During the acquisition phase of classical conditioning, a neutral stimulus is repeatedly paired with an unconditioned stimulus until the new learning has taken place. Have I explained it to you? Is that what I explained to you? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yes. A yes. neutral stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus to form new learning that is a conditioned stimulus. Am I right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So that is termed as acquisition, that new learning. But you have to know this as well. Yes, it's a threat. Now new learning is there. Your students like learning English even though games are not used anymore because of the bonding or association, right? But after some time, right? As there is no bonding or association of the unconditioned stimulus, something called extinction can happen. That is the occurrences of a conditioned response, the new, new learning, can disap disappear gradually. It can decrease. Now they started liking learning English even though games are not used in the normal class also. Now they learn. It's acquisition. But gradually, as there is no bonding or association with games, little by little, they will lose interest once again and that new acquisition or new learning will disappear or extinct over a period of time that it happens. It's gradually that it can happen. Do you understand what extinction is now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. Can you yes, read what is given as extinction? Extinction is when the occurrence, occurrences of a condition response decrease or disappear. In classical conditioning, this happens when a condition stimulus is no longer paired with an unconditioned stimulus. Right, okay. Now it happens gradually. So one fine day, again, students will be actually not interested in learning English. And in the classroom example, mathematics, once you stop using realia, uh, they are still learning mathematics because there is acquisition. And over another period of time, gradual decrease of that interest can happen and ultimately they start once again disliking maths. So that threat is there. So for that, there is a solution in operant conditioning. You can find a solution to this uh, threat of extinction of the newly learn new learning or acquisition through the application of operant conditioning in the classroom. So we will discuss what operant conditioning is next, right? Operant conditioning is also a behavioral learning theory. It belongs to behaviorism. It was actually formulated or proposed by B. F. Skinner. B. F. Skinner. And he also belongs to behaviorist school of thought. So for them, learning is habit formation. It is applicable when it comes to lower order learning, remembering, understanding, and application. Right? Learning is limited to habit formation uh, in the view of behaviorists. And Skinner is also a behaviorist psychologist. So he thinks learning is habit formation. So you can find a solution to this newly new learning or acquisition. There is a threat of extinction. It may disappear over the years, over a period of time. 
Because of that, you can apply operant conditioning as a solution. So what is this operant conditioning? As you all know, behaviorists, behavioral school of thought, those psychologists experimented on animals to generalize findings to human beings. It was actually criticized by other schools of thoughts. But here also B.F. Skinner used animals uh, to formulate this theory of parent condition. Have a get educated guess or have you heard of this experiment by B.F. Skinner? What is it termed as? What is it termed as? What is it termed as? B.F. Skinner used rats, rats for his experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Skinner box. We call it Skinner box experience. Name is the Skinner. As the rats were put into a box for this experiment. This experiment is termed as a Skinner box experiment. So this is the experiment. I will talk to you first about the experiment. Okay. Now, as the dog's experiment by Ivan Pavlovich classical conditioning, this is the B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning Skinner box experiment. Now, here, this is what happened. Skinner put rats into a box, which is termed as Skinner box. Normally, what is the actually natural way or nature of rats? Do they stay at one place or they start running here and there? Running here and there. Running here. here and there. Normally we say, you know, we are in a rat race. Why? Right? We don't have a purpose, but we actually ask, do what others do. Normally they do. Normally. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hello, madam. Madam. I think there was an internet uh, connection issue, but now you can hear me, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I was talking to you about this Skinner box experiment. In this experiment, Skinner put rats into a box, which is termed as the Skinner box now. And once the rats are put into the box, the rats naturally, that's their nature, they started running to and fro here and there. So while they were running here and there, it was made like that. Uh, they happened to press a lever inside the box. Inside the box, there was a lever. Right? The rats actually, when they were actually running here and there, unintentionally, I repeat, unintentionally, they step on the lever. Right? Not intentionally. Unintentionally, they stepped on the lever. And once they stepped on the lever, what happened? Food pellets were dropped in. Food pellets were dropped in. So later on, Initially, it was not purposely done. They were just running here and there. Accidentally, they stepped on the lever and food pellets dropped in. And after a few trials and errors, they learned to press the lever to get the food pellets. They learned to press the lever to get food pellets. Then there's another version of this experiment. Rats were put into a box, skinner box. That started running up and down here and there, naturally. Just ran. And unintentionally, unintentionally, I repeat, unintentionally, they stepped on the lever time to time. And they got electric shock. They got electric shock. It was not purposefully done. They were just running here and there. It was accidentally happening. And they got an electric shock each time they step on the lever. And after several occasions, 
the rats learn not to step on the, to avoid the lever they stopped actually purposefully they did not actually they avoided the lever they learn not to press the lever not to step on the lever so there has been some learning happening how did it happen can you have a guess educated guess how did it happen in the two occasions in the first one when they got put pellets they purposely they started to press the lever to get put pellets when they got electric shock they stopped stepping on that to avoid it how did they learn how oh it's actually did they ah, yes yes a better answer did they experience yeah that experiences matter but is there a specific thing that comes to your mind they know what, what is they, it they know what happened um, their behavior uh -huh. if i say it like this now the food platter food pellets is a reward electric shock is a punishment so they know the, they know what happen in, in the future no Uh, it's like this if uh, according to operant conditioning They according to bm skinner yeah if you are rewarded you tend to repeat that good behavior if you are punished you tend to stop that behavior so you can reward them to do better learning you can punish them to stop bad learning so you can go to woolfolk right you learn not only right things you learn bad things as well so if you learn bad things you have to stop learning it right the teacher has to actually make sure that they avoid it and then you learn good things you have to strengthen it yeah. something like that and you learn not only knowledge but skills and attitudes so here behavior right so a good attitude can be strengthened a bad attitude can be weakened through the application of operant conditioning because bf skinner operant conditioning it also belongs to behavioral school of thought learning is habit formation that habit formation can take place due to rewards and punishment according to bf skinner's operant condition is it clear to you or it's not clear to you clear yeah, ma'am everyone very good so when i send you notes you can read them again right and make your own notes and uh, i really want you to actually know what you learn and you will be able to apply them in classroom as well um one fine day i know my psychological you have to tell right uh ekanisa psychology is a bit of a hard subject if you don't study regular basis you have to study it up otherwise everything become actually too much for you because all theories have their own terms and references ne ekada vasi paadam karanna ba ne id can you yes regular study it up so take time uh, be happy about the fact that you learn something new right and do your part it's beautiful actually psychology is a very beautiful subject but you lose interest because everything piled up and now you have no way of actually referring to it so you tend to actually give it up it happens because you can't just beat about the bush with psychology so on regular basis if you study you can actually easily learn and you can really be happy and you can go for a's and b's as well okay a word of advice thank you so much okay right so then we will go to some other components of operant conditioning now according to operant conditioning learning happens as a result of rewards and punishments so you can use it in classroom to promote learning right because according to behaviorist learning it habit formation 
they refer to lower order learning, lower order thinking. So you can promote that in primary grades. This is more applicable because in primary classes, actually it's more or less lower order learning. Okay. Right. Let's see what are the components discussed by uh, B.F. Skinner. We are learning through rewards and punishments, order and conditioning. Now, this is Skinner box experiment. Here, what are the key components of operant conditioning? You can discuss two things with regard to operant conditioning, rewards and punishments. Because you have to know how it can be applied in that primary classroom to facilitate, promote learning. First one is types of reinforcements or rewards and punishments. Types of Rewards and punishments. Rewards is another term is reinforcement. Okay. Types and rewards. If learning happens through rewards and punishments, what are the types of rewards and punishments that we can use to promote learning? So, B.F. Skinner talks about four types. How many types? Four, four types. Four types. I will actually talk to you about like this. First thing, there are two types as reinforcement or rewards and two punish types of punishments. But, uh, rewards or reinforcement, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Can you repeat what are the two types regarding rewards? Positive, positive reinforcement. reinforcement. Negative. 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 What are the two types regard to punishments? Positive punishments Positive. and negative, negative punishments. punishments. Now let me take four. First two separately. Reinforcements or uh, rewards. I want you to know rewards and re or reinforcements are always used with good behaviors or learning of your students. I repeat, reinforcements or rewards are used with good behaviors or learning of your students. Reinforcements are good for good behaviors, learning. In a punishments, punishments are used with regard to Bad behaviors or bad learning. Is it clear to you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So again, rewards or reinforcement. If you want to actually use rewards or reinforcements with good learning or good behaviors, you want to strengthen them or weaken them. Strengthen them. Strengthen them. Promote them. If it is punishments with regard to bad behaviors or bad learning, you want to strengthen them or weaken them? Weaken them. So now it's very clear. Reinforcements are to strengthen good behaviors and learn. Punishments are to weaken bad behaviors or learn. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now let's take positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement separately. Positive means you are giving something to the learner. Positive now you are giving something to the learner. Negative now you are removing or taking off something from the learner. I repeat, if you use the term positive, you are giving something to the learner. If it is negative, you are taking something from the learner away from the learner or removing something from the learner. Now you apply it to positive reinforcement. Now reinforcement is for the good behavior to be strengthened. If it is positive, you have to give something to the learner. Now think of a good behavior. Now doing homework. Learning your English enthusiastically is the good behavior. So you want to strengthen that good behavior through 
reinforcement. And in this time, you are using positive reinforcement. So you have to give the students something. So you have to give something students like or students don't like. What they like. They don't like. What they like. So they like red stars. They like collecting red stars. So you can actually give them a red star. It is positive reinforcement. Okay. The same example. Students are doing homework on a regular basis. It's the good behavior. So you want to strengthen the good behavior. So you are using reinforcement. But this time you want to use negative reinforcement. So negative means you are taking away something from the learner. So you have to take away something students like or students don't like. You're mm -hmm. taking away something students like or students don't like. Students like. Or students the don't like. Right. Don't like. Yeah. They have to reward. You are removing something from the students that they don't like. For example, they don't like to stay after school to clean the classroom. So you tell them as you are very regular in doing homework as a reward. I really do not want you to stay after school this week to clean the classroom. So you are actually strengthening the good behavior of doing homework on a regular basis. But you are using negative reinforcement. You are not giving something to them. You are taking away something unpleasant from them as a reinforcement to strengthen that good behavior. So similarly, punishments. Punishments are always to weaken bad behavior positive you are giving something to the child negative you are removing something from the child now you first think of a bad behavior bad behavior is getting absent often bad behavior is getting absent often or doing mathematics in wrong manner or something we'll take bad behavior is getting uh, absent often right so you have to weaken that. You are using positive. So you have to give something to the child. As a punishment, you will give something he likes or he doesn't like. He likes. Yeah, right. can take a punishment. Take a punishment. Doesn't like. Something he doesn't like that you have to give him. So what can you give him? He doesn't like black stars. So every time that he is absent, you give him a black star. It is positive punishment. He doesn't like to kneel down in front of class. So when he shouts in the class, that is the bad behavior. You get him to come in front of class and kneel down. You're giving something he doesn't like. It's positive punishment. So negative punishment is you remove something from him. So you have to remove, take away something that he likes or he doesn't like as a punishment. He doesn't like. Ayo, double check. He likes. He yeah. Likes. You have to actually remove something that he does. He likes as a punishment. Yeah. For example, if he has best friend, can we keep away from the best friend? Yeah. Definitely. Yes. It becomes a punishment then. Right? But they talk all the time. So you can actually use negative punishment and you remove the best friend from him. So, uh, something taken away from him, something that he likes. So, it's a negative punishment. Why negative punishments? Why negative reinforcements are used? Why? Can you have an educated guess here? To make Why do we use... Uh, they, do uh, they learn something. After no. that, they, they won't uh, do it again. And he, no, it, mm, no, it and can be done through positive reinforcement and positive punishment also. My negative aspect is introduced. I will tell you, if it is positive reinforcement, they become very selfish. All the time they are working for rewards, rewards, rewards. When the reward is not there, they will not show up the good behavior. Am I right? Yes. yes. Yeah, ma yeah. So you can stop that by introducing negative reinforcement as well. Right? And then again, punishment. If you all the time punish the child by giving them black stars and getting him to kneel down, shouting at him and all that, what will happen? 
the child will be very unhappy in your class. That is a kind of an abuse. Am I right in this yes. world of child rights? Yes. Yeah. So they say better use negative punishment, remove something that they like as a punishment. So it is not abuse then. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so you know, you have to know how to use these rewards and punishments in an ethical manner in your classroom. Because rewards and punishments can be used to promote learning. But it should be used effectively. Otherwise, it will give you disastrous results. So for that, we discuss the four types of rewards and punishments you can select, which is more suitable in different, different contexts. Are you okay? Okay. Yes. Our channel. Yes, ma'am, I'm okay. Oh, you are the only uh, uh, boy in the class? Uh, I think so. I don't know, ma'am. Maybe yeah. we heard. Are there silent killers? <laughs> Sometimes you call the silence is killing because we don't know, right? We don't know what's happening. I just, I, I just actually crack a joke, silent killers because they are very silent. I don't know what is happening. Are there any other boys in the class? It seems no, no. Right. Then you can, when I, when I send this PowerPoint slides, you can read some more examples. Okay. Okay, ma and ma'am, uh, from the words or the phrases, uh, the meaning or the idea, as we thought, was not. Because uh, when we see, we think something, but when madam explained, we got to know there is something that deeper than we think. Yeah, that is so, yes. And the teachers sometimes always, if you actually reward, 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 they get used to rewards only. Then they do it for the purpose of reward. And then ultimately, once the reward is not there, they stop displaying that good behavior. So you give them negative reinforcements with positive reinforcements. Not always positive, but you can introduce negative reinforcement as well. Now, punishment, positive punishment, shouting at them, getting them to kneel down, and then giving black stars is mentally weary. They are actually drained. So we actually, as teachers, don't always use positive punishment. We can instead use negative punishment, which is less threatening. Am I okay? Yes. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reinforcements are for good behaviors. Good behaviors are to be strengthened. But there are two ways. Positive, you give something the students like. Negative to remove something students don't like. And punishments are always for bad behaviors or learning. And they are to be weakened. And positive means that you give something that they don't like. And you remove something in negative punishment that they like as a punishment. How to apply that classroom? Okay. Now, this is also there. Uh, we'll discuss it if it is not too much. Otherwise, I can actually um, omit that part. But uh, if you are okay, I can actually discuss another component, uh, reinforcement schedules. That is, it explains different types of reinforcement schedules that you can actually use in the classroom. It has insights for you, implications for you. So we have another about 15 minutes. We will discuss now. Okay, ma'am. Right. Okay. okay right. And next Wednesday, don't remember, forget that you have the presentation. Okay? Okay. Okay. Then reinforce. Have I, I have a word of advice for the screen now. Maybe it's your first presentation in this module. And you have not done much, so many presentations. It's all right because doing an examination doesn't mean it's just pass your examination with the subject knowledge, right? What is psychology and educational psychology? That is not enough. You have to develop your skills, attitudes, presentation skills, everything. Your ability to self-learn, it 
develops your study skills. So you are a package at the end of the program, right? Once you get the certificate in your hand. So at the same time, you have, I have given you criteria, look at them and be ready. And I'm not going to cut a lot of marks if I see that you are prepared and you have taken pains to actually do that. I can as a kind of an experienced person, I know that whether it's a kind of just uh, doing it or whether you have taken a lot of pains and it's prepared work. So you don't have to actually make mistakes. You have to practice, years and come. So do your part, Puta. You can actually get good marks. One fourth, 25% of your final outcome, final result, final evaluation is this on this presentation. So you have to take a lot of interest and do. If you actually want, if you target a good grade for your this module, pedagogical psychology. Right, it's a word of advice for you. Mama, I see how you do it. Man, why? Why are you not only make a vibhage, but you also make a vibhage. Final vibhage. And so, if you don't get it, you only. Unam doing ek karan na mukda anti mata final mark ek ata meka balak pana nisa. Okay. As your background noise is good, I'm muting you, but I can't mute mute Sanjeev Priyanka. That's background new me noise Sanjeev. Okay. Now looking at, are you listening? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Reinforcement schedules. Reinforcement schedules. Now we are rewarding the students. If we actually haphazardly do reward, if we just reward our students as much as possible, you know, it will be actually very unpractical, impractical, no? Not practical. And it will be actually very uh, not very effective as well. Sometimes it's not practical to reward the child each and every time that they display very good behaviors. And it's not practical. And at the same time, it will not be very effective also. Because you know, according to psychologists, we live in a world of rewards. We live for rewards. And ultimately, I just deviate from this reward reinforcement schedules and tell you, they say because of this reward system in this world, in this competitive world, there are a lot of rewards. And you know what has happened? People are so used to getting rewards and everything is done for a reward. If there's no reward, they will not do that. That is the mindset of people nowadays in our society because of this rewards used unethically. And they have done a research on divorces. Now people divorce me. Marriages are not very successful. They have actually done a research on that why. Divorce rate is very high. And dig deeper into them. They have learned Marriage also has become a marriage of convenience. Marriage of convenience means you marry for a reward. What's the reward? You marry for money. You marry for cars. You marry for status. You get married for uh, the dowry. Love is absent in the marriages. Because why it has happened? When it comes to marriage also, they look for a reward. Otherwise, they don't actually fall in love with anybody. But there should be a reward for them to get married. So because of that, ultimately, the divorce rate has gone very high. One of the reasons they highlight is it's deviating from the lesson. But you can see the gravity of it. Am I right? Yeah, ma'am. Now, what about you? You also work always for rewards. No, ma'am. I don't ask you, but this is what we see, no? Even neighbors, even politicians, 
even as laymen when we actually vote uh, at the elections we think i yo if i give this man my vote i can get a good job like that we don't think of their policies and all that we think of those things and vote them am i right yes so education yes. system is held responsible for those because throughout your life you are made to think of rewards and ultimately when it comes to important milestones of your life also it's actually the reward that matters nothing else this is the world that we have created through our education system right okay forgetting that coming back to this reinforcement schedules that is for effective use of rewards in the class bf skinner talks about reinforcement schedules these are the schedules you look at them schedules you know a schedule right what it means how you can use it right he puts now you can actually stop extinction if you actually start rewarding your students now they have made new learning unconditional condition stimulus and responses or acquisition is there now it can extinct that threat is there so the teacher can introduce reward systems for them to not stop that new learning that is where this operant conditioning is very useful for the teacher right but very impractical and very unethical this reward system can be because of that bf skinner actually introduces this component of reinforcement schedules basically there are two types of reinforcement schedules first one continuous reinforcement schedules what is the first one continuous reinforcement schedule what is the second one intermittent reinforcement schedule now first look at continuous reinforcement what does it mean continuous reinforcement mean each and every time the good behavior is shown the good learning is shown each and every time the good behavior or good learning is shown the child is rewarded the child is rewarded the student is rewarded each and every time the good behavior is shown the student is rewarded what is the problem with this type of this reinforcement schedule not practical can a teacher go on doing that is it practical no no so then why is it needed then continuous reinforcement you can use continuous reinforcement for the formation of new learning for them to actually learn the new learning behavior at the initial stages of establishing a good behavior the teacher can use continuous reinforcement for example you get a new set of students they are not in the habit of doing homework so every time that they do homework you give them a red star why because then they will get into the habit of doing homework so you can get that new behavior established for that purpose you can use continuous reinforcement but it is highly impractical uh not practical why because how on earth that you can go on rewarding the teacher every time once the good behavior is established through continuous reinforcement you can go to the second type of reinforcement schedule what is the second type of reinforcement schedule intermittent reinforcement what is it intermittent reinforcement another word for intermittent is partial what is another word for intermittent partial p a r t i a l partial reinforcement why intermittent or partial 
this is very bad putta you have to be mindful about your background noise if background noise is there please mute your mic okay because it's disturbing to others also and it's tiring for me also to pay right okay then intermittent reinforcement or partial reinforcement is you do not reward the child each and every time that they show good behavior or new learning partially or time to time or partially only that you will reinforce them not every time the good behavior is shown that you reward the child but partially intermittently only that you will actually reward the child so there are four ways of four types of intermittent or partial reinforcement you can see it here can you see it here yes ma'am yeah these are intermittent or partial reinforcement schedule types first you look at this intermittent interval and ratio so reinforcement schedule intermittent interval intermittent ratio so interval mean you specify a period of time interval refers to a period of time or duration period of time or duration ratio means number of time period of time interval number of time ratio right then again it is further down fixed interval variable interval fixed ratio variable ratio so what is it we'll take fixed interval intermittent reinforcement schedule first i repeat fixed interval intermittent reinforcement schedule fixed means interval so interval means duration every friday it's fixed every friday it's fixed am i right yes ma'am every month month is duration so it is interval it is fixed because it's every month you know when so fixed interval intermittent schedule reinforcement example this is from psychology books i give you now as the teacher that you want your students to have the good habit of reading that you know that they are not good in their reading habits they don't go to the library at all so you tell them each time that you go to the library and borrow a book i will give you a red star what is the type of reinforcement schedule each time that you go to the library for the establishment of the good behavior of reading what is the type of reinforcement schedule continuous continuous reinforcement terunadha channa madam yeah i am listening i can understand right others please but channa ke nama matakai not the other names every others names you understand that no now the uh, same example now you think now they are going to the library now they have established the good behavior of reading so now you think as it's we're not practical you think of actually now getting into intermittent reinforcement or partial reinforcement so example of fixed interval intermittent re reinforcement you tell them every week i check your library card and if you have gone to the library and you it means you have read books you are entitled for a red star so every week week is interval so its duration it's fixed because every week so it is fixed interval intermittent reinforcement so we'll go to variable interval intermittent interval means duration variable means it's not fixed you tell the students time to time i will check your library card 
if you have borrowed books i will actually give you a red star they don't know when you are going to actually check it time to time it's not fixed but variable but you refer to the duration so it's partial so variable interval intermittent got it yes ma'am ma'am right now we come to the next type ratio ratio is number of times number of times so fixed means it said how many times so you tell them i check your library card if you have read 10 books once you read 10 books from the library you are entitled for a red star so they know that if i complete reading 10 books i can get a red star it's fixed ratio intermittent am i right yes ma'am yeah, ma then variable ratio intermittent ratio means number of times or items but it's not fixed so you tell your students or time to time you check up uh, if you have read five books bring your library card i will give you a red star so another time i will ah uh, you have read 10 books please come i will give you a star next time have you read four books come you are entitled for a reward then they know Can you hear me? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, they will still go to the library because you know. they know time to time depending on the number of books they can get a uh, reward this is from actually a psychology book that i gave you the now you can think of ways of applying different types of reinforcement schedules in the classroom to strengthen good behaviors of the students in a practical way, way in an ethical way so it becomes more effective so according to a classical conditioning by ivan pavlov learning happens through bonding or association according to b h skinner um operant conditioning learning happens through rewards and punishments so with that i think we can yeah because it's part of your examining nation so hope that yeah. today's lesson is clear to you yeah ma'am yeah so uh, yeah yes tanna you said something excuse no. me ma'am i said it's clear yeah yeah yes putta can you you can talk somebody wanted to talk Uh, couldn't hear what you told at last. Uh, I said that the lesson is clear to you, and to be prepared for the assignment because twenty five percent of your final evaluation is on the presentation. Oh, okay. okay. So take interest and do. Don't get actually scared or nervous. Right? We are human beings, so we know what are our limitations. I can understand. what i want to see is you have read so you are prepared you are trying your level best right though it's an assessment it's a learning opportunity for you i want you to develop your communication skills study skills 
and the subject knowledge as well related to motivation in learning. So with that, can I stop? Yeah. Yes. I will be sending you this lecture note or the PowerPoint and lecture material uh, through the institute. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Bye. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.